There was a news story in mid-2018 that started me thinking about those often slave Irish women who were among the first settlers, the first mothers of Iceland. I'm Helen Shaw and this is Mother's Blood, Sister's Songs, the story of how the genetics of Iceland reveals its Gaelic roots. Now, In that news story, it said that an anthropologist at the University of Iceland and a company called Decode Genetics in Reykjavik had analysed the DNA, the human genome, of 25 ancient Icelanders whose skeletal remains had been found in burial sites across the island. Sequencing that DNA, they found that the settlers had come roughly in an even split from Norway, which is what they always thought, and more surprisingly, from the Gaelic world, with over 60% of the women, those first mothers of Iceland, coming from places like Ireland and Scotland. Now, the force behind this research is an often larger-than-life scientist called Cowdy Stephenson. Cowdy is a neurologist. He was a professor at Harvard University, and he returned to Reykjavik and founded Decode Genetics, largely to use genetic research in predicting and tackling diseases and conditions like multiple sclerosis. So while Decode Genetics' work has made a groundbreaking contribution to the Global Human Genome Project, it's also given us an insight into the settlement of Iceland, challenging the often monolithic view of Iceland as solely a Norse culture, but also showing the remarkable impact that hundreds of years of isolation has had on this small Icelandic population. So we had the chance to sit down with Kauri at Deco Genetics. It's a rather futuristic complex on the University of Iceland campus. And a bit like the trolls of Norwegian legend, he played with us a bit, making us answer his quiz before starting the recording and giving us his own particular take on what the science is telling us. We know that these Norwegian boys, they stopped by in British Isles and they picked up women and went up to Iceland to settle down. And we have no information on how large percentage of these women went up to Iceland on the basis of we would, what we would call in today a mutual consent. I think it is possible that some of them were not particularly pleased by having to go up to Iceland. There's a book that was written about a thousand years ago called The Book of Settlement. And The Book of Settlement says that Iceland was settled by Norwegian Vikings or young Norwegian men who stopped by the British Isles, picked up women and uh, picked up slaves and went up to Iceland and settled down. And the story says that these were disgruntled people who couldn't tolerate Harald the Fairhead who took over the whole of Norway. And they did not want to live under his uh, command, so they went up to Iceland. We took a look at this and uh, we actually looked at mitochondria, the energy stations of the cells, as a micro-maternal lineage, and we looked at the Y chromosome as a micro-paternal lineage. And basically, we showed that in current-day Iceland, about 75% of the Y chromosomes are Norwegian, and about 65% of Icelandic mitochondria are Celtic. But this is in the current-day Icelandic population. But we have lived here for 1,100 years in an extraordinarily tough environment. Very little or very difficult agriculture and fishing in small boats in a very difficult sea. So we decided to go and look at the DNA from skulls from the settlement of Iceland, from graves from the time of the settlement. And we looked at the same markers, we looked at the mitochondria and we looked at the Y chromosomes. And indeed, what came to us as a surprise is that the current-day Icelanders are much more different 
from the settlers of Iceland than current Norwegians and current Brits. So this merciless island has changed us more than your population has been changed by this continuous stream of people coming through. It's remarkable. We have been changed more just by living isolated alone. And the reason for that is what is called drift. We have had population bottlenecks that have decreased the diversity in our population dramatically. Another thing that we discovered recently is that this idea that our ancestors were the courageous men who didn't want to tolerate the domination of the king is incorrect. We helped our Norwegian colleagues to look at the difference between the various regions in Norway going from north to south. And actually it turns out that Icelanders came from the southernmost tip of Norway, not from the west coast like the story tells us. And this southernmost tip of Norway is the poorest part of Norway where agriculture has always been really bad. The difference between current day Icelanders and those who settled Iceland are probably mostly due to drift. And the drift is caused by these random assortments of chromosome into germ cells, into sperms and into eggs. And because that's totally random, you can end up, just because you have a population bottleneck, you can end up losing a lot of chromosomes or like. You can lose a lot of what generates the diversity in the population because of the population bottleneck. Very little of what has happened in these 1100 years can be explained by selection, but some can probably. And, and I can give you an example of clinically significant alteration that has happened over the past 1100 years. When we started to look at the genetics of a malignant melanoma, the most malignant of the skin tumors. It was known that there is one mutation in, in menocortin type 1 receptor, you know, the receptor for the hormone that turns your skin dark when you're exposed to cell, sunlight. That mutation is the mutation that turns your hair red and your skin makes your skin very sensitive to sunlight. And in Spain, this mutation triples the risk malignant melanoma in Sweden, it doubles the risk. In Iceland, it has no impact on risk, none at all. And you may ask, how is that possible? Because to turn that mutation into a, a cancer, you need exposure to sunlight. And when you have this mutation, you're sensitive to sunlight, so you tend to avoid it. And I can, I can assure you that if you live in Iceland and you're sensitive to sunlight, you can avoid it. In Spain, it is much more difficult than in Sweden in between. And this mutation is found in 6% of Spaniards, 17% of Swedes, and 26% of Icelanders. So because it is inconsequential in Iceland, there is no selection against it. So it has had an opportunity to expand in the population. So these changes, although probably most of them are, are somewhat inconsequential, there are occasional consequential changes that have taken place. And one of the things we can do in Iceland is that on the basis of relatively few genetic markers, we can find the geographic origin of people. We can say, uh, you, your family must have come from southeast corner, northeast corner, or whatever. And assuming that is true, or let's say, if you, if you give us the assumption that is true, what I'm telling you now, then there must be also phenotypic differences between the people in these various regions of Iceland, because our you know, human genetics is based on the assumption that there is some relationship between diversity in your sequence and diversity in phenotype. And actually in Iceland, a very large percentage of schizophrenia comes from the southeast corner of Iceland, a large part of the breast cancer comes from northwest and southwest, etc. So having as much insight into the sequence of a whole nation as we do, we are able to divide it into all kinds of little compartments based on, on genetic markers. So I asked Kauri Stevenson, how do Icelandic people feel about this Gaelic lineage? 
I mean, we've been struck by the fondness people have for that Irish slave princess story of Melkorka and the way in which people like to tell us they're descended from her. Melkorka comes up not, not just in Laxdala, it comes up in Yaula also. And it's an interesting story. The daughter of an Irish king. Because if you can, if you trace people to maternal, direct maternal lineage, you can look at the mitochondria and you can show that people who, who can trace their lineage to the same ancestral grandmother, that they have the same mitochondria. And there's actually fairly accurate documentation of the genealogy. But when you go beyond that, there are so many holes and people are guessing. And there are very significant events that the indicate that we were different from the Norwegians. We started to write books before them. Basically, everything that is known about the uh, old history of Norway was written in Iceland. Heimskringla was written in Iceland, for example, which is sort of the Bible of Norwegian history. So I think that people have had all kinds of reasons to question that we were pure Norwegians. And we just are who we are, all right? There's nothing we can do about it. I think that we have always been very fond of the Gaelic aspect of who we are. I think that we have looked at ourselves as a nation of, of writers, people of literature. And I think that we have always somehow thought that it came with a, with a Celtic mix. So it came from our mothers, not from our fathers. <laughs> And that's Dr. Kauri Stephenson, founder and CEO of Deco Genetics. Now, I've added some links to the genetic research around the Iceland population in the text box and on the website. And you can also check out a short video clip of our chat with Kauri on the website mothersbloodsisterssongs.com. Thanks for listening. 